Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. This is Biochemistry One, and the title of this segment is Integration of Metabolism Two. So this is the second of a two-part uh, set in which we're looking at uh, at the integration of metabolism on the scale of the entire body, human or animal body. So remember what we've we've started the entire semester looking down at street level, so to speak, looking at all the individual molecular uh, reactions, biochemical reactions that are involved in the biochemistry and the metabolism of an organism. And now in the last several segments, we've been zooming back progressively and looking at how all these uh, reactions are controlled at the cellular level, but uh, also uh, controlled at the level of tissues and organs and systems so that an organism can respond um, in a coordinated fashion to its metabolic status, uh, the opportunities and dangers that it confronts. Okay, so let's, uh, we're, we're, we looked in the last segment at uh, second messengers produced by hormone signals. And we talked about the fact that there are receptors for those hormones that generate those uh, uh, signals, those second messenger signals that are controlling things like glycogen degradation and synthesis, for example. In this, the first part of this segment, we're going to look at these one of these receptors in much more detail uh, after putting the receptors in context. So let's look at that. So uh, again, we'll be focused here on the glycogen to glucose and back again cycle, which is the fundamental cycle which either stores energy in glycogen or liberates energy as glucose according to need and in response not just to cellular need but to systemic need as uh, signaled by uh, the hormones that we talked about last lecture and whose receptors we'll look at a little bit more carefully here. And, uh, and those uh, hormones uh, released either from the medulla of the adrenal gland or the uh, islets of Langerhans in the pancreas are have the role of uh, spreading the word to all the tissues in the uh, organism about the energy status of the organism itself, independently of the local status of an individual cell. Again, coordinating everyone's behaviors uh, in pursuit of the common interests of survival and reproduction, the things that natural selection scores. Okay, so here is an uh, image of a muscle and a liver cell uh, that we used in the previous segment. And we're going to be looking at the, the uh, hormonal system, the um, adrenal medulla releasing epinephrine and the pancreas releasing glucagon and insulin as indicated here. And we're going to look at uh, the various receptors uh, in various degrees of detail. Let me call your attention to the first to the fact that there are two receptors uh, boxed in blue, which are unique to the liver cell, not in the muscle cell. The, so the glucagon and the alpha adrenergic receptors are unique in this case to the liver and not to the muscle cell. This is a common thing as we've talked about before. The same hormone can have profoundly different implications for two different cells based on the receptor systems that the, those two different cells uh, display on, the sur on their surfaces. Notice that there are two of the four receptors that we're looking at here that are shared in contrast, the ones boxed in pink with the liver and a muscle cell. These are the insulin receptors and the beta adrenergic receptors for epinephrine. Okay, all right, there it is, beta adrenergic receptors for epinephrine. The insulin receptors are a class of receptors that are well known. There are many different members of that class, uh, which we're not going to talk about in, th in this course, but when you go into advanced uh, cell biology and physiology courses, you'll talk about in great detail. They, uh, the receptors themselves initiate kinase cascades directly. That is, they're not setting off a second messenger like a cyclic A or uh, calcium. They are setting off, a, they, they, the receptors themselves will initiate a phosphorylation event and a second and a third cascade of phosphorylation events, allowing signal amplification of the sort that we talked about in the in the context of the protein uh, kinase A cascade that in that controls glycogen phosphorylase, for example. Um, and there are many I I different kinds of these. As you can imagine, since it's not a generic second messenger like cyclic A or calcium, uh, each of these specific uh, kinase cascades can have very specific targets. It's a closed channel. So in fact, a single cell can have dozens, and generally does, have dozens of these uh, uh, direct kinase receptor systems. Again, we're not going to talk about those in detail in this course, but you'll learn a great deal more about them elsewhere. Um, the uh, uh, alpha adrenergic receptors, we're also not going to talk about in detail here, but notice that they initiate a calcium signal. Uh, they normally uh, uh, trigger uh, either the influx of calcium from the extracellular domain or um, less commonly the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, there are pumps that both pump calcium out into the cytosol, out into the tissue fluids and inward into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. 
so that the calcium levels are orders of magnitude higher in tissue fluids in the blood and in the endoplasmic reticulum lumen than they are in the cytosol. So in fact, there are a whole set of uh, uh, processes that uh, uh, recognize elevated calcium levels um, uh, that uh, can be produced on very short notice by either opening calcium channels in the plasma membrane or out opening calcium channels in the endoplasmic reticulum. And there's a protein, a very generic protein called calmodulin, which is really well understood, which interacts with many other proteins. It's kind of an adapter and it has a very specific uh, structure that changes conformation set of helices that bind calcium and change conformation in response to elevated calcium. And then there are a whole set of different proteins that have evolved to associate with calmodulin and read that conformation change in calmodulin as a elevated calcium signal. Again, a very interesting story that you'll learn about in much more detail in other advanced courses, but that we're not going to talk about in much detail here. Uh, finally, we are going to talk in detail about the beta adrenergic receptors for epinephrine. And we're going to look at these because they are very important to the control of metabolism. Remember what ep epinephrine does, adrenaline, it's a signal of great danger or opportunity. That is, it's, mobile t it's uh, warning all the cells in the body to get ready to mobilize energy stores. But we're also interested in uh, this receptor because it's a member of a very large class of receptors, uh, so-called heterotrimeric G protein receptors. They're called that because of at their core is a heterotrimeric G protein. There are many different of these, and there are many different receptors. Uh, in this class that are involved in many different processes. So we're looking here not at a single idiosyncratic receptor, but we're looking at a single idiosyncratic receptor as uh, uh, emblematic or representative of an entire class of receptors that does many different things throughout the organism. Okay, so this is a, a very both a specific and a general lesson. Okay, so here is the, the, uh, a sort of uh, uh, high-altitude summary of how a... Uh, heterotrimeric G protein hormone receptor works. So notice that there is a uh, sort of a ovoid uh, shape that is the receptor. A hormone is bound in, this, in our case here, epinephrine, and it changes the conformation of that receptor, causing it to associate with a G protein. G protein, we'll zero in on all of these molecules in more detail in a moment. We're getting the overview here. G protein is called because it binds GTP and GDP. And it has two properties. It binds uh, GTP, becomes activated, and it uh, uh, separates into pieces and moves around in ways that we'll talk about in a moment and activates other things like adenylate cyclase in this case, uh, as we'll come to in a moment. But then it also has the property of slowly hydrolyzing that GTP back to GDP and becoming inactive again. So it's, it's transducing a signal from a receptor to, uh, to in this case, adenylate cyclase. So receptor, G protein cyclase, it's transducing a signal from the receptor to the cyclase, but it's doing so in a way that's self-extinguishing. In other words, once you turn it on, it doesn't just stay on. It goes on and communicates that signal for a while, seconds or minutes, depending upon the receptor, or even milliseconds, depending upon the receptor. And then it spontaneously hydrolyzes that GTP, goes back to the ground state, and it has to be reactivated by the receptor again in order to transmit a signal again. In other words, the signal is well designed to be there when it's there and to go away quickly when you don't need it. So it's very responsive, very uh, um, uh, fast on its feet, so to speak. So let's go around the cycle here and look. So uh, the notice what happens in the uh, second panel. Uh, the GDP is released and a G GTP is absorbed. That activates the G protein. It then moves over to the cyclase, activating the cyclase to produce cyclic AMP, which is going to be released into the cytosol. Notice that this whole apparatus is embedded in the membrane, in the plasma membrane. So the extracellular and intracellular environments are here. It's going to take that hormone signal and transduce it, in this case, into a cyclic AMP signal, a second messenger. So epinephrine becomes cyclic AMP in this case extracellular to intracellular. And then uh, notice here the activation of the cyclase by the association of the activated G protein. And then the G protein hydrolyzes that GTP after a certain amount of time, again, milliseconds, seconds, whatever it might be, depending upon the specific uh, member of this uh, class of heterotrimeric G proteins that we're talking about. It's not obvious here that the G protein is a trimer. It will be when we zero in on it.